Hello, and welcome to the sixth episode of What Sex Got to Do With It. Mm. And I'm here again with Heather Remoff, the author, the 84 year old great grandmother, <laughs> my favorite great grandmother in all of New England. <laughs> uh, you are, you're really getting excessive there. <laughs> like we're going to have to rein you in a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, good you're going to make a lot of great grandmothers. Unhappy. Be careful. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. Now that you put it that way. All right. All right. Maybe I'll rein it in a little bit next time. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so let's go into chapter five. And so chapter five is called the differences that make a difference. And as I've been doing for the last three or four um, episodes, we want to tell us why that title. Yeah, because I want to talk about in in that chapter. I think I talk about the things. You know, sometimes a very small difference makes a huge difference in outcome. And the differences that make a difference with humans are the way we, our brain evolved and our reproductive strategies evolved. They're very, very different. And I don't remember, we talked about before, and if it's in this chapter or later, um, when I was in grad school and talking about doing the research I wanted to do, and I was trying to explain to one of the professors who happened to be a primatologist um, why I was interested in interviewing women. I thought it would give us a clue as to ev our evolu the evolutionary past of humans. You know, I subscribed to Darwin's theory that female choice drove um, sexual selection. And he looked at me and he said, choice? He said, if you've ever seen a female chimp in heat, it's total pandemonium, a wild orgy. There's absolutely no choice at all. And then he went down the hall laughing and saying, so much for your theory of female choice. And I thought, oh, wow, that may be the difference that makes the difference between chimps and humans. That was my eureka moment that made me think concealed ovulation is something that sets humans apart from other Right. Other, other, all mammals, but uh, right. other primates in particular. Yeah. So that's one of the differences that makes a difference. Language is a difference that right. makes a, a difference right. too. And the concealed ovulation is certainly going to come back to that you know, towards the end of this discussion. Uh, and, and so, because I, I, I'm not sure how much time that's going to take. I just want to get in yeah, sure. a couple of questions before then. So, uh, and these are kind of technical. So you start off talking about the notch two gene and how it seems like it may have an effect on brain size. I mean, because apparently humans have two copies of that, whereas great apes have just one copy of that. You know, you remember that part of it? Yes, I remember, and, and, but and I don't necessarily subscribe to that theory. I report oh, on it. You report on it, okay. Yes, All right. uh, and the reason I don't necessarily subscribe to it is the gentleman who talked about that. He mentions previously I forget the number of thousands of years when the human brain first right. expanded, right. and yet that was before the Notch 2 gene evolved. So I'm right. saying if it's the Notch 2 gene that drove the evolution of a large human brain, how come our, our um, cranial capacity was already large before that gotcha. gene okay. evolved? Gotcha, gotcha, so, I understand. So, so, but, but many people do feel that that's that, that that's that's a place to look. I don't happen to be right, one of right, them, right, but right. I respect that theory. You know, that gentleman has done a lot of research yeah. in genetics and is very skilled. Right, right, because that because my other question was going to be that's on chromosome one, and then the the fusion was on chromosome two, on right? Chromosome two. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Got it. You know. So, so there's um the story you know about uh. This family, the Spanish family, meaning that had a fusion of chromosomes 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. meaning, so that's another case where you have a fusion that takes the number of chromosomes down, meaning yep. from 46 to 44. Question, were there children, were the children able to reproduce? I, that, I never could find data on that. Okay. And, and whether they were able to reproduce, you know, there, there was no data on that. The, I've, that was listed in, in the paper 
describing the end hand chromosome fusion of uh, chromosome two and made the point that it's not fame, uh, you know, fa fatal to have that happen and that those children were otherwise healthy. But they don't specify whether, you know, I never could find out. I tried to Google it and research it. I could never find anything further about that family. But I'm, the parents, I think, both, as if I'm remembering correctly, both had uh, the chromosome fusion. The parents of those kids right. also had that. Uh, and what, you remind me, Len, what, what chromosome was that? 13 and 14. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, that's, so. So it can happen. It does happen. That's okay. All right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I was, I was thinking that some, and, and the whole basis of that was that they kind of identified each other, mm -hmm. maybe subconsciously, I mean, yeah. you know, because they yeah. had that, that difference. I mean, so then I guess that answers the question. Yeah. I mean, it, they are able to reproduce. I mean, mm -hmm. but, the so at least the, the ones that, the parents that had it, I mean, and presumably, I mean, the kids would have I mean, that. That, that same, yes, but also. that same fusion. And apparently it didn't impact very much because from what little information there was in, in the paper that I read, no obvious difference in traits, whereas the difference between humans and chimps is pretty dramatically right. obvious. So I think it really depends which chromosome fuses, and it's relatively rare to have end-to-end -end chromosome fusions. Right, right, right. right. And, and, and it's being... Just more as a commentary, I mean, you point out how well we only pretty much notice the bad mutations. Yes. You know, I mean, things that may have a positive effect, we don't really necessarily identify it as a mutation. We yeah. simply say, well, that's a variation yeah. in the species. I mean, uh, or, or just, oh, my daughter's so beautiful, she has extra long legs. We never stop to think, wait, wait, did you don't go to a doctor and say, do a genetic workup on this child to see why her legs are so incredibly long. You know, we don't we don't do that if it's a trait that's not causing a problem. And of course, I don't. I happen to believe that that there are traits that get inherited that are not necessarily good or necessarily bad. They're just there. They don't right. necessarily carry an advantage. However, in the future, they might. Should there right. be some shift in the environment, they might prove to be. Right. advantageous and I think that's one of the wonderful things about sexual reproduction as opposed to asexual is we carry a hidden store of genes, genes that are not necessarily expressed but can be called on right. when times change. Right, 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 right. So, so I mean, we're going to go back to uh, what you were talking about earlier about the female chimps mean and, and the difference between one of your proposed or hypotheses is that I mean because humans women, you know, have the ability to conceal their ov ovulation and they have greater control I mean, oh. over who... So, what about pheromones? Oh, I, I'm a big believer in pheromones. <laughs> right. I, I think uh, pheromones, uh, you know, we're not necessarily aware of them, right. but I think they play a very large part. Um, I don't you know, I have done no research on the, the pheromonal associations of, say, ovulation, even concealed ovulation. Right. But I think pheromones, in my chapter on language, I developed the theory that uh, pheromones are inherently honest, whereas with language we can lie. But um, concealed ovulation just gives women a choice. I mean, my professor, the primatologist, it doesn't sound like that female chimp is... is uh, is make no apparent choices. Now, you don't know what cho choices are being imposed physiologically, you right. know, what, whether there are certain sperm that she is way of blocking, et cetera, et cetera. But according to him, a complete orgy, complete pandemonium, no evidence of choice at all. I, I would think that if you look a little deeper, you will find, I, my suspicion would be, you'd find some kind of choice. But with humans, no apparent estrus. That's absolutely unheard of in mammals. I, I, you know, that we all know the dog back in the days right. when I was a, a, a kid, nobody got their dogs neutered and right. spayed. And you'd see all the little male dogs marching down the highway very determinedly. They were on their way somewhere. They picked up the pheromonal right. cues that somewhere there was a female dog in heat and they were on their way. But with humans, that's the, you know, we don't announce. When right. we're off your so, so you don't think the pheromones announce? 
no, no, not, the, not because, in the same. No, I know, I know, yeah, I, know, yeah. I, know I, I know it's a matter of degree, you know. But I was just thinking about maybe I mean, it kind of attracts, you know. It, it, it's possible. Yeah. I, 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 I have, I have great faith in the power of pheromones, but in humans, I think other things are create uh, attraction. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. You know, and as you know, the women I interviewed did not feel they were in control of courtship. None of them did. They felt they sat home and waited for a phone call from a man. But when I would ask them how they met the gentleman in question, oh, the detail they would go into. Well, one time my car was in the shop and so um, I took the train and there was, oh, there was the cutest guy on the train. And so from then on, I started taking the train and I took the same, I got on at the same time he did and gradually got comfortable enough. We'd say hi, then I'd sit next to him. A lot of signal exchange going on. I postulate that women are gathering a lot of information about a male in that time, helping them to make the choices they want to make. Someone asked me, I, I gave a talk um, earlier in the week at a, at a Zoom conference of economics, and in the question and answer period, um, someone asked me, asked me, it, have I interviewed young women today? And I admitted young women today, and um, the sort of, I don't even like to use the word courtship, like this um, hookup culture totally, totally bewilders me. And I, uh, in my book, I, I mentioned Caitlin Flanagan, Fla Caitlin Flanagan, a writer for The Atlantic, and she described it in a way that's just perfect to me. She's a little younger than I am, but not a lot. And she said, when she hears young women today describe their encounters, their sexual encounters, actually, she said, the language is all familiar. I know what the words mean. I understand what they're saying. But in terms of what's happening, what they're describing, she said, I feel like I'm from another planet. And I, I sort of have that same reaction. I don't gone to um, a lecture at the Broad Institute, and it had a reception afterwards, and there were a couple young women at, at my table. And when they learned what I was working on, they, they said, well, it's so odd. One said, you know, my friend and I, we've both had this uh, happen to us where we see a guy that we think is really cute, and we ask him to have sex with us, and nothing. And I thought, oh, Oh, my dear, <laughs> you are going about it all wrong. You've put veto power into his hand. That's a last resort um, uh, technique for women. First, we do, first thing we do is get ourselves into the geographic area of the man that's caught our eye. We, we move into his space so he can see us. Then we engage in signal exchange of all types, you know, looking at, looking away indicating interest in each other. So before, you know, you just gradually, gradually work, work, work up to the point where you're either saying yes or no, where the, the young woman who spoke to me, you know, after the lecture at the Broad, she, they were skipping all those first steps and going right to the veto power, which to me is the least effective power. You're not exercising much choice at all if you're just saying yes or no. So I don't see that as a good strategy. I mean, it's you know, if you've gone through the other steps, you reach a point where you may want to say no. But I, I, um, I think in my first book I mentioned, it's a rare man who asks a woman out if she hasn't already signaled that she's going to say yes. So by the time he makes the phone call that the women I interviewed felt they were sitting around waiting for, uh, they put a lot into it. Uh, oh. Uh, you know, memorizing a man's schedule, waiting for him after a class, just pretend, oh, I just happened to be walking by as your class is uh, letting out. Meanwhile, she's asked all his friends what classes he takes, what hour he takes them, those kinds of things. A lot of behind the scenes strategizing goes on that's meant to look like right, it didn't, yeah. it, like, like, like it was not planned. Right. And I think uh, women themselves cannot be aware that they're doing it. As I said, the women I interviewed just did not realize how much power they had in terms of determining their choices of male partners. Interesting. You know, um, so, so, um, so 
So this is kind of along the lines of concealed ovulation. I'm not challenging I mean, the hypothesis me, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to make sure that my understanding is correct and it's based on something I saw on PBS a long time ago. I mean, it was to say that I mean, women I mean, in different parts of the cycle are attracted to different kinds of men. I, th I would agree that that's probably true. Right, so it, as I recall, I mean, the part of the cycle where the woman is most likely to get pregnant she is more attracted to, I mean, they would say, I think the way they phrase it is like the bad boy, you know, uh, uh, kind of like the, the, one, the one who may not be the most, I mean, the one who would stay in your life the longest. I mean, when she's not in a cycle, uh, or, in, or if she's in a part of the cycle where, where she's not most likely pregnant, she is attracted to the stable, the, the good, the, 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 I, the good I, guy. I, I hypothesize just the opposite. Interesting. Uh, very high self-esteem uh, accompanies ovulation. Ovulation is accompanied by high self-esteem in women. And my hypothesis is, and uh, I, the women I interviewed, and you know, I asked about birth control use uh, yeah. when I interviewed them. Um, my hypothesis is that when women have high self-esteem, they avoid men that I call jerks, but um, would be more drawn to men who would be good fathers and who are themselves worthy men when they're... But now women do also pick the man that's at the top of the hierarchy. Yeah. So depending on the culture and the age, I mean, like in middle school and high school, young girls might think the jock is just the greatest guy, right. um, whereas later in life they might choose differently. So I think that varies with age and, and the cultural definitions of success. When I interviewed women, they defined what success was to them. And so that was my measure of a successful man if it met that woman's definition of a successful man rather than having, you know, the... So, but I think yeah. when women are ovulating, they do have high self-esteem and that that probably in itself is a selection pressure for picking men who'd be more likely to stick around. Right. You know, hey, I'm, I'm worth more than this guy is willing to give me kind of thing. You know, my value is, is high enough that I don't need to settle for somebody who's just playing with me. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. No, I, so, but I don't know. I'd be curious to see to, to see that uh, the special that you saw because a lot of these things have not been researched nearly right. enough. Yeah. Right, right, right. And this, okay, this is a while ago. It was on PBS, I mean, so I put a yeah. little more stock in, yeah. in, oh, in what they present. I me mean, less stock perhaps in my memory, although I'm sure my memory in this case is, is correct in, in them associating I mean, the period at which they would be pregnant, that they were more attracted I mean, to the bad boy. Yeah. You know, well, they, you know, uh, ladies uh, love uh, outlaws. There is that expression. Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> and, and so, and, and I think maybe that, and, and what would fit with that is that the, uh, the, that person would be, would have genes that are kind of more, I won't say, I won't, when I say dominant, that has the wrong no, impression no, I, no, no. with respect to the recessive. Like a rank in the hierarchy. Yeah, yeah exactly. A, a rank in the hierarchy. As opposed to recessive dominant, you know, uh, and, and that, that would in, no, a dominant give more. Yeah, a dominant hierarchy, yeah, yeah, a behavioral that, dominant yeah, hierarchy. Yeah, which would yeah, make and the women do select men at the top of the behavioral hierarchy. They do. Right. And those hierarchies are based on what's important in whatever culture the woman is in. Right, so, right, right, right. so I, th I think that supports yeah, what you're uh, saying. Uh, yeah. So, 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 uh, so we're going to kind of start wrapping this one up a little early, you know, uh, uh, just because they all don't have to be 30 minutes. Maybe, but hey, I'm going to back up a little bit and say that, talk, quote one thing, um, is that you say, I often toy with the idea that incidents of genetic non-disjunction could have accounted for sudden appearance of new mm -hmm. species. And, and that certainly has an appeal to me, and, and you're probably going to say, well, you, you could, probably in a better position to find this out yourself, but do, was there any kind of, did you look into that anymore to see if, if Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, Stephen Jay Gould yeah. and Niles Eldridge, I think his name is pronounced, yeah. you know, they wrote, they developed a theory of punctuated equilibria, equilibria. Yeah. and they, I always read their books looking for them to speculate on the suddenness, uh, you know, th yeah. their 
punctuated equilibria was that species stay relatively constant and then all of a sudden there'll be an explosion of new species. And I thought, or, or dramatic change. You know, they'll be constant for years, and then there's a dramatic change. And when reading it, I always was puzzled that neither one of them said non-disjunction might be the reason for that. So I was already open to the idea before I heard about chromosome fusion, about just the ways chromosomes separate and recombine might contribute to sudden evolutionary change. I, yeah. I was already open to that because, and I forget when Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge came up with the theory of punctuated equilibria, probably yeah. in the late 70s. Does that sound yeah. right to you? Yeah, I mean, maybe so, because I mean, actually, Gould used to come to the Bloomington lab mm -hmm. a lot you know, uh, for um, lectures there, you know, and, and so punctuated e equilibria was a part of the discussion, and I was in that lab, and he started in the, mm -hmm. the, the mid 80s. I mean, Gould was a very bright, Bright guy, you know, and I'll tell you, you know, a lot of times at the during the seminars, we his questions we would just go on, you know, and all, you just learn a lot. Of his questions were like chapters in a book. You oh, know. his his brain <laughs> yeah, fired yeah, like that. Uh, yeah, you know, like fireworks yeah, going off. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and and you know, he has he had a level of intelligence I mean, that very much reminds me of you, oh, you know, well, which is why lovely. it's Thank such a you. pleasure um, <laughs> listening to you, and, and that's why I asked you a question. And I listened oh. for a while because I just get so much out of it, much like I did uh, your book. So thank you for that's discussing nice. Chapter 5, and our next chapter is going to be Chapter 6, which is my, what a big brain you have. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>